If I make here an attempt to outline the course of the fighting of the 11th Army and its Romanian fighting friends in the Crimea, it is primarily to immortalize the memory of my comrades in the Crimean Army. At the same time I want to give those of them, who survived, a general picture of the events of that time, which were known to them then only in separate details. In 1941, 1942 they showed marvels of bravery and endurance in almost continuous battles and almost always against a numerically superior enemy. They attacked and pursued the enemy, always with incomparable offensive impulse and held firm when the situation seemed hopeless. Often they may not have known why the army command had to set them tasks that seemed impossible, why they were thrown from one section of the front to another. And yet they fulfilled these requirements with the greatest loyalty and trust in the command, and the command was always sure that it could rely on its troops. The framework of this book does not allow to describe in detail the course of all the battles of this campaign, to list all the feats of individuals and units. In addition, due to the lack of relevant archival material, I could name only those whose feats have been preserved in my memory, which would be unfair to many others who performed no lesser feats. So I am forced to limit myself to the presentation of the general course of operations. And with this statement to the reader will be clear that the activity of the troops was the main factor that brought a decisive outcome in the offensive battles, the main factor that allowed the command to cope with defeat in the most difficult situation, and the main factor that provided the possibility of a victorious conclusion of the campaign decisive battle to destroy the enemy on the Kerch Peninsula and the capture of the sea fortress of Sevastopol. But the Crimean campaign of the 11th Army will hopefully arouse interest not only among its former participants. This is one of the few cases when the army had the opportunity to conduct independent operations in a separate theatre. It had only its own forces, but was spared the interference of the high command. In addition, in this campaign for ten months of continuous fighting took place and offensive and defensive battles, conducting free operations on the type of manoeuvre warfare, rapid pursuit, landing operations of the enemy, who had superiority at sea, fighting with guerrillas, and the attack on a powerful fortress. In addition, the Crimean campaign will cause interest, and because its theatre is the same dominant over the Black Sea Peninsula, which still retains traces of the Greeks, Goths, Chinos, and Tatars, already once Crimea stood at the centre of historical development, the names of the places that played a role even then. Alma, Balaclava, Inkerman, Malakov, However, the operational situation in the Crimean War of 1854-1856 cannot be compared with the situation in 1941-1942. At that time, the advancing Western powers dominated the sea and could enjoy all the advantages arising from it. In the Crimean campaign of 1941-1942, however, the dominance at sea was in the hands of the Russians. The advancing 11th Army not only had to occupy Crimea and take Sevastopol, but also to neutralize all the advantages that the Russian domination of the sea provided. It's the situation at the time of assuming command of the 11th Army. On September 17, I arrived at the location of the headquarters of the 11th Army, the Russian military port of Nikolaev, located at the mouth of the Bug, and took command. The previous commander, Colonel General von Schobert, had been buried in Nikolaev the day before. During one of his daily sorties to the front in an airplane-type storch, he sat on a Russian minefield and died with his pilot. In his person, the German army lost a noble officer of spirit and one of its most experienced frontline commanders, which belonged to the hearts of all his soldiers. Army headquarters, whose operational department later became part of the headquarters of Army Group Don, almost entirely consisted of excellent officers. I remember with gratitude the time when I cooperated with such excellent assistance for two and a half hard war years. During this long period, we were repeatedly faced with new and difficult tasks. We had to deal with more than one new environment. In this way, our headquarters avoided the danger of falling into the routine that so easily engulfs headquarters, especially in position warfare or in quiet sections of the front. At the same time, the joint solution of ever new problems strengthened mutual trust which in turn fostered the development of personal initiative and independence of each. I can't recall by name all my employees of those years. I will name only the names of my closest associates. These are my chief of staff, Colonel Weller, whose imperturbable calmness was an invaluable support for me during the most critical weeks of the Crimean campaign. Then my then chief of operations, later promoted to General Bussey, 
who rose from that position to the position of Chief of Staff of Army Group South, and thus remained with me until the end of my tenure as commander. He was not only my most valuable adviser during all those difficult years, whose opinion could always be relied upon, whose capacity for work never waned, and who never lost his temper in the most critical situations. On top of that, he became my most loyal friend and after the war, abandoning for a time all his plans and intentions, sacrificed more than a year of his time to undertake my defence at the trial. Finally, I would also like to name our excellent rearguard chief, Golk, also later a general, who often relieved me from the cares of the often very difficult business of organising the rear of the army. After the war, he also proved his loyalty to me. Although our headquarters, first as the headquarters of the 11th Army, and then as the headquarters of Army Group Don worked very closely together, and the relations between me and my officers were characterised by mutual trust. Still, at first, the personnel of the headquarters of the 11th Army, not without some anxiety, awaited the arrival of a new master. My predecessor, General von Schobert, in his manners was a typical Bavarian, and even a harsh word at him sounded good-natured. About me, there was a reputation as a man characterised by a certain Prussian coldness and restraint. At any rate, I learned this, though long afterwards, from a comic interlude during my trial in Hamburg. As this act of costly revenge was unfolding with all its inherent ghostly seriousness, the chief prosecutor discovered a taped space in the combat log of the 11th Army, which he had brought in as a prosecution document. What a discovery! It could only conceal something that could be used to bolster the charges against me. The sticker, which was supposed to conceal some mysterious text, was removed in the courtroom. What mischief will be revealed now? I myself did not know anything about this taped place, because I, although I signed as commander this journal, as required by the position, but for lack of time never read it, this was the duty of the chief of staff. After the sticker had been removed, the prosecutor read the revealed text to the court. He read not without confusion and with growing embarrassment. The passage roughly read, A new commander arrives. He is I Meisters and we will have a hard time but we can talk to him openly. The judges looked at each other uncertainly and began to chuckle. It appeared that what the prosecution had pinned such high hopes on had not at all resulted in a sensational exposure of the accused. No doubt the judges themselves had to deal with such bosses. This incident, however, was soon cleared up. Shortly before my arrival, Chief of Staff Wheeler held a meeting of staff officers, at which he briefly characterised and the personality of the new commander. The officer who kept the journal included in his entry, also Wheeler's words. Wheeler, however, was tactful enough to gloss over these words when presenting the journal to me for my signature. This is how chance sometimes reveals to a man the opinion of others about himself. But, as I said above, we subsequently established the best of relations. When in 1944 I surrendered command, many of my assistants also did not want to stay in the headquarters. The new environment in which I found myself having taken command of the army, was characterised not only by the expansion of my authority from corps to army scale. In addition, I learned in Nikolayev that I was entrusted with the command, not only of the 11th Army, but at the same time with the adjoining 3rd Romanian Army. It's the order of subordination of troops in this part of the Eastern Theatre, for political reasons, was quite confused. The supreme command of the Allied forces, the 3rd and 4th Romanian and 11th German armies, which had emerged from Romania, was placed in the hands of the head of the Romanian state, Marshal Antonescu. At the same time, however, he was bound by the operational instructions of General Field Marshal von Rundstedt, as commander of Army Group South. The headquarters of the 11th Army was like a link between Marshal Antonescu and the command of the Army Group, and advised Antonescu in operational matters. By the time of my arrival, however, it turned out that Antonescu retained at his disposal only the 4th Romanian Army, which was conducting an offensive on Odecia and the 11th Army, which was now directly subordinated to the headquarters of the army group, received at its disposal for further movement, eastward the second of the two Romanian armies involved in the war, the 3rd Romanian Army. It is already unpleasant when the army headquarters has to command, in addition to its own, another independent army. But this task is twice as difficult when it comes to the Allied Army, especially since between these two armies there are not only known differences in organisation, combat training, command tradition, which is inevitable in the Allies, but that they also differ significantly in their fighting ability. 
This fact made it inevitable that we should intervene more vigorously in the management of Allied Army troops than was customary within our army and than was desirable in the interest of maintaining good relations with the Allies. And if we still manage to establish interaction with the Romanian command and troops, despite these difficulties, without much complication, it was due in large part to the loyalty of the commander of the 3rd Romanian Army, General Dumitrescu. The German liaison groups, available in all headquarters up to and including division and brigade, also tactfully, and where necessary, energetically contributed to the interaction. But above all, in this connection we must mention the Romanian head of state, Marshal Antonescu. No matter how history evaluates him as a politician, Marshal Antonescu was a true patriot, a good soldier and our most loyal ally. He was a soldier who tied the fate of his country to that of our empire, and right up to his overthrow he did everything to use Romania's armed forces and its military potential on our side. If perhaps he did not always succeed fully, it was due to the internal peculiarities of his state and regime. In any case, he was a loyal ally, and I remember my cooperation with him only with gratitude. As for the Romanian army, it undoubtedly had significant weaknesses. It is true that the Romanian soldier, mostly descended from peasants, is himself unassuming, hardy, and brave. However, the low level of general education, only to a very limited extent, did not make it possible to train him as an enterprising single combatant, let alone as a junior commander. In those cases where the prerequisites for this were present, such as in the case of the German minority, Romanian national prejudices were an obstacle to the promotion of German soldiers. Outdated customs, such as corporal punishment, also could not contribute to the improvement of the troops' fighting ability. They led to the fact that soldiers of German nationality tried in every possible way to get into the German armed forces, and since their admission there was prohibited to the SS troops. The decisive drawback that determined the fragility of the internal structure of the Romanian troops was the absence of a non-commissioned officer corps in our sense of the word. Now unfortunately, we too often forget how much we owed to our excellent non-commissioned officer corps. Of no small importance was further the fact that a large proportion of the officers, especially the higher and middle ranks, were inadequate. Above all, there was no close connection between officer and soldier, which we took for granted. As for the officers' concern for the soldiers, it was clearly lacking the Prussian school. Combat training, due to lack of experience in warfare, did not meet the requirements of modern warfare. This led to unjustifiably high losses, which in turn had a negative impact on the morale of the tr troop management under French influence since 1918, remained at the level of the ideas of the First World War. Sarmament was partly obsolete and partly inadequate. This applied especially to anti-tank gunners, so that Romanian units could not be expected to withstand Soviet tank attacks. Let us leave aside the question of whether more effective assistance from the Empire was not needed here. Another point that limited the possibility of using Romanian troops in the war in the East was the great respect that the Romanians had for the Russians. In a complex situation, this carried the danger of panic. This point should be taken into account in the war against Russia in relation to all Eastern European nations. In the case of the Bulgarians and Serbs, this circumstance is aggravated by a sense of Slavic kinship. And one more circumstance should not be overlooked when assessing the combat effectiveness of the Romanian army. By that time Romania had already achieved its own goal in the war, having regained Bessarabia, which had been taken from her shortly before. Already Transnistria, which Hitler had ceded or imposed on Romania, lay outside the sphere of Romanian claims. It is clear that the idea of having to move further into the depths of the formidable Russia did not arouse much enthusiasm among many Romanians. In spite of all these shortcomings and limitations, the Romanian troops, as far as their capabilities allowed, fulfilled their duty. First of all, they willingly obeyed the German command. They were not guided by considerations of prestige, like our other allies, when matters had to be dealt with in a businesslike manner. Undoubtedly decisive in this was the influence of Marshal Antonescu, who acted as befits a soldier. Specifically, the review of my advisers regarding the subordinate to us three Romanian army was as follows. After relatively heavy losses, it is completely incapable of conducting an offensive, and to the defence will be able only if it is adapted to the German support. May I be permitted to report here a few episodes concerning my relations with my Romanian comrades. In the spring of 1942 I once visited the 4th Romanian Mountain Division, which, under the command of General Manoliu, 
was fighting the partisans in the mountains of the Ye at times we had to use for this purpose the entire Romanian mountain corps, reinforced by a number of small German units. First I inspected several units, then I was led into the headquarters building. Standing in front of a large map, General Manoliu proudly showed me the entire route taken by his division from Romania to the Crimea. It was clear that he wanted to hint that this, he said, was in my remark. Oh, so you have already travelled halfway to the Caucasus. He was not at all enthusiastic. During the rounds of the apartments, every time I approached the location of a unit or a subdivision, a trumpet sounded. Apparently it, it was a kind of greeting for me, but at the same time a warning to the troops. The bosses are cut. But I still outwitted my clever guys. In the location of one of the units I approached the field kitchen to try what was being prepared for the soldiers. Such behavior of the high command was a complete surprise for them. I was not surprised at the poor quality of the soup. Then, as usual, I was invited to lunch at the division headquarters. Well, here everything was, of course, different. The Romanians did not have the same supply of soldiers and officers. A rather sumptuous dinner was given, but not without respect for hierarchy. The junior officers were entitled to one less dish, and the wine at the end of the table, where the division commander sat, was undoubtedly of better quality. Although the supply of the Romanian troops was provided by us, it was still difficult to exert a permanent influence on the distribution of food. The Romanian officer was of the opinion that the Romanian soldier, a peasant by origin, was accustomed to the coarsest food, so that the officer could easily increase his rations at his expense. Above all, this applied to goods sold for cash, especially tobacco and chocolate, which were supplied according to the number of soldiers on the payroll. The officers argued that the soldiers were unable to purchase these goods anyway, so they were all stuck in the officers' mess halls. Even my protest to Marshal Antonescu got me nowhere. He undertook to investigate the matter, but then informed me that he had been reported to him as if everything was in order. The section of the front, the commander which was entrusted to me, represented the southern tip of the eastern front. It covered mainly the area of the Nogai steppe between the lower reaches of the Bug the Black and Azov Seas and the bend of the Dynapira south of Zaporozhye, as well as the Crimea. Direct contact with the main forces of Army Group South, advancing north of the Dynapira, we did not have, which provided greater freedom of operation of the 11th Army from the forested areas of northern Russia, where I had to conduct operations unsuitable for such terrain tank corps. I got to the steppe expanses, where there were no obstacles or shelters. Ideal terrain for tank formations, but unfortunately my army did not. Only the beds of small rivers that dried up in summer formed deep ravines with steep banks, the so-called gullies, and yet there was some charm in the monotony of the steppe. Perhaps everyone felt a longing for spaciousness, for boundlessness. One could drive for hours in this terrain, following only the compass arrow and not meet a single hill, not a single village, not a single human being. Only the distant horizon seemed to be a chain of hills, behind which perhaps hid paradisiacal places. But the horizon went farther and farther away. Only the poles of the Anglo-Iranian telegraph line, built by Simanes in his time, broke the monotony of the landscape. At sunset the steppe began to shimmer with the most beautiful colours. In the eastern part of Nogai steppe in the area of Melitopol, and northeast of it, there were beautiful villages with German names Karlsruhe, Gelenenthal, they were surrounded by lush gardens. Sturdy stone houses testified to former prosperity. The villagers kept the German language pure, but in the villages there were almost only old men, women and children. All the men had already been taken away by the Soviets. The task assigned to the army by the general command aimed it at two divergent directions. First, it had to, advancing on the right flank of army group south, to continue the pursuit of the enemy retreating to the east. To do this, the main forces of the army had to move along the northern shore of the Sea of Azov to Rostov. Secondly, the army had to occupy the Crimea, and this task seemed particularly urgent. On the one hand, it was expected that the occupation of the Crimea and its naval base, Sevastopol, will have a favorable impact on the position of Turkey. On the other hand, and this was particularly important, the enemy's large air bases in the Crimea posed a threat to the Romanian oil region, which was vital to us. After the capture of the Crimea included in the 11th Army Mountain Corps, was to continue to move through the Kerch Strait in the direction of the Caucasus, apparently supporting the offensive, which was to unfold from Rostov. The German High Command, 
therefore at that time still had fairly far-reaching objectives for the 1941 campaign. But it was soon to become clear that this dual task of the 11th Army was unrealistic. The 11th Army in early September forced the lower course of the Dnieper River at Berislav. This was a feat in which the Lower Saxony 22nd PD was particularly distinguished. From this point, however, the direction of the army's further advance was bifurcated because of its dual task. Two took command. The situation was as follows. Two corps, 30 AC of General von Salmute and 49 Mountain Corps of General Kubler, continued to pursue the enemy defeated on the Dnieper in the eastern direction and approached the boundary Melitopol bend of the Dnieper south of Zaporozhye. The 54th Army under the command of General Ganzem, consisting of 46 PD and 73 PD, turned to the approaches to Crimea, to the Perikop Isthmus. Arrived from Greece, 50 PD partly was under Edessa, partly clearing the Black Sea coast from the remnants of the enemy. Three Romanian army in the composition of the Romanian Mountain Corps and Romanian Cavalry Corps was west of the Dnieper. The army intended to stop there for a rest. Apparently some role was played here by the reluctance to move eastward beyond the Dnieper after having to cross the bug, because it was no longer part of the political goals of Romania. It's the twofold task that now fell to the share of the 11th Army, the pursuit in the direction of Rostov, and the capture of the Crimea with the subsequent advance through Kerch to the Caucasus, posed a question to the army common, whether it is possible to fulfill these two tasks and how to do it. Should they be accomplished simultaneously or sequentially? Thus, the decision, which was essentially within the competence of the general command, was left to the discretion of the army commander. There was no doubt that it was impossible to solve both tasks simultaneously with the available forces. In order to occupy the Crimea, needed a much larger force than those that had approaching Perikop 54 AC. True intelligence reported that the enemy took from the Dnieper to Perikop, apparently, only three divisions. But it was unclear what forces he has in the Crimea, and especially in Sevastopol. It soon became clear that the enemy could use for the defense of the Isthmus not three but six divisions. Later the Soviet army defending Odessa was to approach them. However, on this terrain, even the stubborn defense of three divisions was enough to prevent the invasion of the Crimea 54 Arc, or at least significantly wear down his forces in the battles for the Isthmus. Crimea is separated from the mainland by the so-called Rotten Sea, the Savage. It is a sort of Watts or Salt Marsh, for the most part impassable to infantry, and besides, owing to its shallow depth, it presents an absolute obstacle to landing craft, the Perikop Isthmus on the west, and the Genic Isthmus on the east. But this latter is so narrow that it can accommodate only the road and railroad bed, and even then interrupted by long bridges. This Isthmus is unsuitable for conducting an offensive. The Perikop Isthmus, the only one suitable for the offensive, is also only seven cam wide. It could be attacked only frontally. No hidden ways of approach the terrain did not provide. Flank maneuver was excluded, because on both sides was the... The Isthmus was well equipped for defense with field-type structures. In addition, it was crossed by an ancient Tatar moat with a depth of up to 15 meters. After breaking through the Perikop Isthmus, the advancing army was further south on one more Isthmus, Ishun Isthmus, where the offensive strip, squeezed between salt lakes, narrowed to three, four camps. Taking into account these peculiarities of the terrain and taking into account that the enemy had superiority in the air, it could be assumed that the battle for the Isthmus would be heavy and exhausting. Even if it was possible to make a breakthrough at Perikop, it was doubtful whether the corpse would have enough strength to fight a second battle at Ishun, but in any case, two three divisions were in no way sufficient to occupy the whole Crimea, including the powerful fortress of Sevastopol. In order to ensure the fastest possible occupation of the Crimea, the army command had to transfer here large additional forces from the group pursuing the enemy in the eastern direction. Those forces that led the pursuit would have been enough, as long as the enemy continued to withdraw but for the far-conceived operation, the purpose of which was Rostov, they would not be enough. If the enemy will take the defense on some prepared line or, in addition, pull up new forces, if we consider the decisive advance in the direction of Rostov, then the Crimea should have been abandoned for now. But will it ever be possible to free up forces for the capture of the Crimea? This question was not easy to answer. In the hands of an enemy who retained dominance at sea, the Crimea meant a serious threat on the deep flank of the German Eastern Front, 
not to mention the constant threat it posed as an airbase for the Romanian oil region. An attempt to simultaneously conduct two corps deep operation on Rostov and beyond, and one course to capture the Crimea could only result in the fact that both tasks will not be accomplished. Therefore, the army command gave preference to the task of capturing the Crimea. In any case, it was impossible to undertake this task with insufficient forces. It was clear that the 54th Army for the offensive on the Isthmus had to be given all the available forces at our disposal artillery RG key, engineering troops and anti-aircraft artillery. Shifty PD, which was still in the rear, had to be pulled up by the corpse no later than the beginning of the fighting for Ishulnsky Isthmus. But this alone was still not enough, for the rapid seizure of the Crimea after the breakthrough through through the Isthmus, or even already in the battles for Ishun, would require another corps. The Army Command opted for the German Mountain Corps consisting of two mountain rifle divisions, which, in accordance with the instructions of the High Command, still had to be transferred later through Kerch to the Caucasus. In the battles for the mountainous southern part of the Crimea, this corps would be used more effectively than in the steppe. In addition, it was necessary to try to rush motorized forces after the breakthrough through the Isthmus to take the fortress of Sevastopol. For this purpose, behind the advancing 54 AC was to be the life standard. Such a decision of the army command meant, of course, a significant weakening of its eastern wing. To release the above-mentioned compounds, in addition to the 22nd Division, which was guarding the coast north of the Crimea, could be used only three Romanian in by personal negotiations with General Dumitrescu. I succeeded in getting the army quickly moved across the Dnieper, despite the above-mentioned considerations of the Romanians, who did not want it. It was clear that the army command was taking a great risk in taking these measures, since the enemy could have stopped the withdrawal on the eastern front of the army and tried to take the initiative into his own hands. But we could not do without it, if we did not want to start the battle for the Crimea with insufficient forces. While the preparation of the 54th Army for the offensive on Perikop, because of difficulties with the supply, was delayed until September 24, and while the above-mentioned regrouping of forces was un already on September 21, there was a change in the situation in front of the eastern front of the army. The enemy took the defense on a previously prepared position on the boundary west of Melitopol Bend of the Nyipa south of Zaporozhye. The pursuit had to be stopped. However, the Army Command did not change its decision to remove the German Mountain Corps from this area. In order to reduce the risk associated with this, it was decided to mix the remaining German units here with units of the 3rd Romanian Army. The Romanian Cavalry Corps on the southern section of this front was subordinated to the 30 German AK, while the 3 Romanian Army on the northern section to strengthen it was included 170 German PDN. On September 24, the 54th AK was ready for an offensive on the Pericopismus. Despite the strongest support of artillery, 46 and 73 PD, advancing on the sun-scorched, waterless, completely devoid of shelter Solenshak steppe, had a very difficult time. The enemy turned the Isthmus to a depth of up to 15 km into a continuous, well-equipped defence strip in which he fiercely fought for each trench, for each stronghold. Nevertheless, the corps managed to take Pericop and overcome the Titar moat on September 26, fighting off strong counterattacks of the enemy. In the next three days of the most difficult offensive, the corps broke through the enemy's defense to its full depth, took the heavily fortified settlement of Armyansk, and came to the operational space. The defeated enemy withdrew to the Isthmus of Ishan with heavy losses. We captured 10,000 prisoners, 112 tanks, and 135 guns. However, we have not yet been able to enjoy the fruits of this victory, achieved at such a high cost. Although the enemy suffered heavy losses, the number of divisions opposing the corps now reached six. The attempt to take with a move also Ishansky Ismus, with the current balance of forces and heavy casualties suffered by the German corps, apparently exceeded the capabilities of the troops. The intention of the army command to pull up to this point fresh forces, the mountain corps and the lifeguard, was thwarted by the enemy, anticipating, apparently, our attempt to quickly occupy the Crimea. The enemy pulled up new forces to the section of the front between the Dnieper and the Sea of Azov. On September 26, the enemy went on the offensive here on the eastern front of our army with two new armies, 18 and 19, consisting of 12 divisions, partly newly arrived, partly newly replenished. True, the first strike on the front of 30 AK was not successful. 
but the situation became very tense. But in the strip of the 3rd Romanian Army, the enemy knocked out of position the 4th Mountain Brigade and made a gap 15 chem wide in the front of the army. This brigade had lost almost all of its artillery and seemed to have lost all its fighting ability. Two other Romanian mountain brigades also suffered heavy losses. There was nothing left but to order the German mountain corps, already approaching the Pericop Isthmus, to turn back to restore the situation on the front of the 3rd Romanian army. At the same time, however, the army command was more or less deprived of the right to freely dispose of its only motorized unit, the life standard. The high command ordered that this unit should be transferred to the first tank group and take part in the planned breakthrough to Rostov. So the army command had to abandon its use in order to develop success on the isthmus. Liebstandard was ordered to return to the Eastern Front, the first echelon of the army headquarters, in order to be closer to both fronts of the army, was placed already on September 21 at the CP in the Guy Steppe in Ascania Nova. Ascania Nova formerly belonged to the German family name Falsfe. It used to be a model farm known throughout Russia, but now the estate became a collective farm. The buildings were neglected. All the machines were destroyed by the retreating Soviet troops, and the threshed bread, piled in mountains in the open air, was doused with gasoline and set on fire. The piles of bread smoldered and smoked for weeks. It was impossible to extinguish them. Ascania Nova was called so because the Duke of Angalta, who later ceded the estate to the Faltzfein family, had once purchased a large plot of land here. Ascania Nova was known throughout Russia and far beyond its borders for its reserve. Right in the middle of the steppe he rose a large park with streams and ponds that were home to hundreds of species of waterfowl, from black and white red ducks to herons and flamingos. This, a park in the steppe, was truly a paradise, and even the Bolsheviks did not touch it. Adjoining the park was a fenced area of steppe, stretching for many square kilometers a variety of animals. Deer and fallow deer, antelopes, zebras, mouflons, bison, yaks, new. Importantly, marching camels and many other animals that felt quite well here. Only a few predatory animals were kept in open enclosures. It was said that there was also a snake farm but the Soviets had supposedly released all the poisonous snakes into the wild before they left. However, our search for snakes was not successful, although it turned out that they did exist. One day an air alert was announced. The chief of staff, Colonel Wheeler, thoughtfully ordered in due time to dig a slot near the headquarters building, and at his command all the officers of the staff quietly went there, observing, as always in military service, the chain of command, when the first low-flying enemy planes appeared and everyone headed for the steps leading to the gap, Colonel Wohler suddenly stopped on the bottom step like a stumbling block. From behind him came the voice of one of the officers, I dare ask you, Mr. Colonel, to go a little further. We are still standing outside. Wheeler turned around with fury, without moving a step, and shouted, Go where, Father? I can't. There's a snake in here and indeed all who approached saw a snake of rather unpleasant appearance at the bottom of the crevice. It half raised itself, shook its head violently, and from time to time emitted a vicious hiss. Since the choice between the enemy planes and the snake was decided in favour of the planes. Of course, this comic incident was the topic of our dinner conversations. The chief of engineers was recommended to include in the combat training programme Along with the detection of mines and snake detection, someone suggested to report to the Oak about this new type of enemy weapon, apparently used exclusively against the headquarters of formations, but in general then had to check all the buildings, whether there are no time mines in them, because in Kiev the German headquarters, and in Odessa the Romanian headquarters were killed by such mines. Other funny incidents happened in this reserve. One day our chief of operations was sitting at his desk deep in maps, a tame doe wandered into the one-story building and looked curiously with her meek eyes at the diagrams hanging on the wall. Then she came up to Colonel Bus and poked him in the lower back with her muzzle. He did not like to be disturbed at his work, jumped up from his chair and shouted, This is too much, this is, and, turning around, saw, instead of the expected troublemaker, the devoted and melancholy eyes of a doe, he politely escorted the unusual visitor out. When we left Ascania Nova, he took two wavy parrots named Auska and Nova from the aviary. They fluttered merrily around the operations room. Admittedly, they were less of a nuisance than the countless flies, who were particularly fond of the colour red. The result was that on the maps hanging on the wall for a long time, the enemy troops marked in red gradually became less and less. 
Unfortunately, in reality, the opposite was true. Another small story, illustrating the relationships within our headquarters, tells one of the officers of the headquarters. We, the junior officers of the headquarters, were under the strict supervision of the head of the operations department, Colonel Bussey. He called us usually just guys from the operations department. But, of course, even the strictest supervision could not affect our young temperament. So, one day we organized a vodka party for a small circle. It took place in the room of the operations department, where we usually slept all five of us, some on field bunks, some on tables, closely pressed together. After midnight, when the last bulletins were transmitted, our celebration reached its climax. In the corridor of the school, where there were offices and rooms of the commander and chief of staff, we organized a solemn procession in nightgowns. We began to march singly, and in doing so considerable dissension between the infantrymen and cavalrymen was discovered. Commands and objections rumbled through the empty corridor. Suddenly everyone froze like pillars of salt. Slowly one of the doors opened and General von Manstein appeared. In. He circled us with his cold gaze and said politely in a low voice, Gentlemen, can't you be quiet? You might as well wake up the chief of staff and Busset, and the door closed. The aggravated situation in front of the front of the army forced us to organize on September 29 the advanced CP in close proximity to the threatened section of the front. Such a measure is always advisable in a critical situation, as it prevents the subordinate headquarters to move to more distant places from the front, which always makes an unfavorable impression on the troops. In this case, this measure was particularly necessary, since some Romanian headquarters had a distinct tendency to move to the rear as soon as possible. On the same day, the German mountain corps and the life staff began an offensive from the south in the flank of the enemy, who had broken through in the section of the 3rd Romanian army and was unable to fully utilize its initial success. While here it was possible to restore the situation, there was a new crisis on the northern flank of 30 AC. Here did not withstand the onslaught of the Romanian cavalry brigade and required my very energetic intervention on the spot to prevent its hasty retreat by transferring here the lifeguard. It was then possible to eliminate the threat of a breakthrough here. Although the situation on the eastern front of the army, as shown above, was very tense, it still concealed one great advantage for us. The enemy again and again made frontal strikes with his two armies to thwart our intentions for the Crimea. And, apparently, he no longer had reserves to cover himself from the Zaporozhye and Denepropetrovsk bridgeheads on the Denepirfa, from where his northern flank was threatened by the first tank group of General von Kleist. A few days after I outlined my thoughts on this matter to the command of Army Group South, the appropriate order was issued on October 1. While the 11th Army still shackled the still advancing enemy, in the north gradually began to increase the pressure on him from the first tank group. The enemy lost the initiative. On October 1, the Army Command had already given the order to the 30th Army and the 3rd Romanian Army to go on the offensive or begin to pursue the enemy if he would withdraw. In the following days, we managed in cooperation with one tank group to encircle the main forces of both armies of the enemy in the area of Big Tokmak, Mariupol, Berdyansk, or destroyed them in parallel pursuit. We captured 65,000 prisoners, 125 tanks, and over 500 gunners. With the end of the Battle of the Azov Sea on the southern flank of the Eastern Front, there was a regrouping of forces. Apparently, the general command of the German army realized that one army cannot simultaneously conduct two operations, one in the direction of Rostov and the other in the Crimea. The offensive on Rostov was now entrusted to one tank group, which was subordinated to the 49th Mountain Corps and the Life Standard, and the army had now the only task the occupation of the Crimea II remaining in its composition corps. Three Romanian army, which again came under the command of Marshal Antonescu, was now only to carry the protection of the Black Sea and Azov coast. However, having addressed directly to the Marshal, I obtained from him the agreement that the headquarters of the Romanian mountain corps, with one mountain and cavalry brigade, will follow us to the Crimea to protect its eastern coast. Although the task of our army was now limited to a single objective, the high command demanded of us that one corps be moved across the Kerch Strait to the Kuban as soon as possible. In this demand, Hitler contained a clear underestimation of the enemy, in view of which the army command and reported that the condition for such an operation is a decisive victory over the enemy in the Crimea. The enemy will hold the Crimea to the last, and would rather give up Odessa than Sevastopol. 
and indeed as long as the Soviets, having supremacy at sea, stood with one more foot in the Crimea, the transfer of part of the army through Kerch to the Cuban was out of the question, especially since the army now had only two corps. In any case, the army command took advantage of this to demand the transfer of another corps of three divisions. Apparently, in accordance with the previously mentioned wish of Hitler, our army was transferred some time later 42 AC, which included 132 and 24 PD. Subsequently, it turned out that in view of the efforts made by the Soviets to hold Crimea for themselves, and later to regain it, such reinforcement already in the battles for the peninsula was absolutely necessary. Battles for the Isthmus of Ischen. Our immediate task was to resume fighting on the outskirts of the Crimea for the Isthmus of Ischen. They may say that this is the most ordinary offensive, but these ten-day battles stand out from the ordinary offensive as the brightest example of the offensive spirit and selfless dedication of the German soldier. In this battle we had almost none of the prerequisites that are usually considered necessary for an offensive against fortified defences. Numerical superiority was on the side of the defending Russians, not on the side of the advancing Germans. Six divisions of the 11th Army were very soon opposed by eight Soviet rifle and four cavalry divisions, because on October 16, the Russians evacuated the fortress of Osa, unsuccessfully besieged by the 4th Romanian Army, and transferred the army defending it by sea to the Crimea. And although our aviation reported that sunk Soviet ships with a total tonnage of 32,000 tons, still most of the transports from Odessa reached Sevastopol and ports on the western coast of Crimea, it's the first of the divisions of this army soon after the beginning of our offensive and appeared at the front. German artillery had superiority over enemy artillery and effectively supported the infantry. But on the enemy's side on the northwest coast of the Crimea and on the south bank of the Saivash operated armoured batteries of coastal artillery, invulnerable so far to German artillery. While the Soviets had numerous tanks for counterattacks, the 11th Army had none. In addition, the command had no opportunity to facilitate the troops' heavy task of the offensive by any tactical measures. A surprise attack on the enemy in this situation was out of the question. The enemy was expecting an attack on well equipped defensive positions. As at Pericop, any possibility of covering or at least conducting flanking fire was excluded, as the front rested on one side in the Sivash and on the other in the sea. The attack was to be conducted only frontally, as if along three narrow channels into which the isthmus was divided by the lakes located here. The width of these strips allowed first to enter into battle only three divisions of 54 AC, while 30 AC could enter into battle only when will be occupied some space south of the isthmus. In addition, completely flat, covered only with grass salt marsh, Stape did not provide the advancing no shelter. The air supremacy belonged to the Soviet Air Force. Soviet bombers and fighters were continuously attacking every target they could find. Not only infantry in the front line and batteries had to be entrenched, it was necessary to dig trenches for every cart and horse in the rear area to shelter them from the enemy's aircraft. It came to the point that anti-aircraft batteries did not dare to open fire so as not to be immediately suppressed by an air raid. Only when the army was subordinated to Mulders with his fighter squadron, he was able to clear the sky, at least during the day. At night, too, he could not prevent enemy air raids. Under such conditions, in a battle with the enemy stubbornly defending every inch of land to the advancing troops were extremely high demands and losses were significant. I was constantly on the move in those days to familiarize myself with the situation on the spot and to know how and how to help the troops engaged in heavy fighting. With concern, I saw how the combat effectiveness is falling. After all, the divisions forced to lead this difficult offensive suffered heavy losses even earlier at Pericop, as well as in the Battle of the Sea of Azov. She turns a moment when the question arose. Could this battle for the Isthmuses end in success? And if it was possible to break through the Isthmuses, would there be enough forces to achieve a decisive victory in the battle with the intensifying enemy to occupy the crime? On October 25, it seemed that the offensive impulse of the troops completely dried up. The commander of one of the best divisions has twice reported that the strength of his regiments are running out. It was the hour which perhaps always happens in such battles, the hour when the fate of the entire operation is decided, the hour that must show what will win the determination of the offensive to give all their strength to achieve the goal, or the will of the defender to resist. 
struggle over the decision to demand from the troops, the last exertion, with the risk that the required heavy sacrifices will still be in vain, takes place only in the soul of the commander. But this struggle would be meaningless if it did not rest on the confidence of the troops and their unyielding determination not to back down from the intended objective. The command of the 11th Army did not wish, after all that he had to demand from the troops, to miss a victory at the last minute. The offensive impulse of the soldiers, preserved despite everything, overcame the stubborn resistance of the enemy. Another day of heavy fighting, and on October 27, decisive success was achieved. On October 28, after ten days of fiercest fighting, the Soviet defences collapsed. Eleventh Army could begin the pursuit. Tiet. The vanquished usually moves at a greater speed than the victor. The hope of finding safety somewhere in the rear encourages the retreating one. In the victor, on the contrary, in the hour of success, there is a reaction to the overreption required of him. In addition, the retreating always has the opportunity to delay the pursuing rearguard fighting and thus help his main forces to break away and escape from the pursuing enemy. Therefore, the history of warriors knows few examples of when the pursuit led to the destruction of the main forces of the defeated. This result was always achieved when it was possible to overtake the retreating enemy in a parallel pursuit and cut off his escape route. This was also the goal of the 11th Army in those days. By all accounts, the enemy's maritime army arrived from Odessa after the collapse of his defences. South of the Isthmus was retreating southward in the direction of the Crimean capital Simferopol. The city was the key to the only highways that led along the northern spurs of the Yela to Sevastopol and the Kerch Peninsula and through the mountains to the southern coast with its ports. Another group apparently intended to withdraw to the southeast, that is, on the Kerch Peninsula. Three divisions, apparently as a reserve, were in the area of Simferopol and Sevastopol. Defeated but numerically still quite strong enemy, which in addition could receive reinforcements from the sea, had, in any case, different possibilities. He could try to retain the southern part of the Crimea as a base of operations for the fleet and for aviation, as well as a bridgehead for future operations. For this purpose, he could have tried to reoccupy the defences at the northern spurs of the Yela in order to rely on the inaccessible mountains to defend southern Crimea. At the same time, he would try to block the approaches to Sevastopol, Alma, and to the Kerch Peninsula at the Isthmus of Parpatcha. If the enemy considers that he does not have enough forces for this, he can try to occupy the Sevastopol fortified area with the main forces and part of the forces to withdraw to the Kerch Peninsula to at least hold these two key positions of the Crimea. On this basis, I sent the newly arrived 42 AC and three divisions to pursue the retreating in the direction of Feridosia, Kerch grouping of the enemy. The corpse was to preempt the enemy on the Isthmus of Papacha and prevent his evacuation through Feodosia or Kerch. The sad in task of the main forces of the army was to rapidly pursuing the enemy to thwart any attempt of the Russians to take the defense at the northern spurs of the mountains. But above all, it was necessary to prevent the main forces of the enemy retreating to Simferopol to hide in the Sevastopol fortress area. 30 AK as part of 72 and 22 PD was ordered to advance on Simferopol so that the enemy could not linger on the spurs of the mountains. Quick breakthrough through Yala on the road Simferopol. Alushta should have been as soon as possible to provide the corps control over the coastal road Alushta, Sevastopol. 54 AK was tasked to pursue the enemy in the direction of Bakhizara, Sevastopol. First of all, he had to cut the road Simferopol, Sevastopol as soon as possible. In addition, the army command hoped that perhaps it may be possible to take Sevastopol in a surprise attack. However, for this we lacked a motorized compound which we could throw forward for the sudden capture of the fortress. In this case, we would have avoided many casualties, would not have required heavy fighting that lasted all winter, and then the offensive on the fortress, and on the eastern front would be timely released a whole army for new operations. All the efforts of the army command to get instead of the taken from his life standard 60 motorized division, which due to lack of fuel was still inactive as part of the first panzer group, to nothing led to because of the stubbornness of Hitler, who had before his eyes only one goal, Rostov, hastily formed by the army command compound consisting of a Romanian motorized regiment, German reconnaissance battalions, anti-tank and motorized artillery divisions could not compensate for this lack. In this pursuit, once again the courage and initiative of commanders of all grades and the dedication of the troops were best demonstrated, 
Looking at how weakened by heavy losses, exhausted to the extreme by the most difficult conditions of the campaign regiments, sought to break through to the tantalizing goal, the southern coast of the Crimea, I involuntarily recalled the soldiers of those armies, which in 1796 stormed to conquer the areas of Italy promised to Napoleon. November 16 the pursuit was completed, and the whole Crimea, except for Sevastopol fortress area, was in our hands. With swift actions 42 AC thwarted, the enemy's attempt to resist us on the isthmus of Parpasha, the corpse took the important port of Fedosha before the enemy was able to evacuate through it any significant forces. On November 15, the corpse took Kerch. Only insignificant enemy forces managed to cross the strait to the Taman Peninsula. 30 AC managed to split the main enemy forces into two parts, making a daring breakthrough along the mountain road to Alushta, located on the southern coast, after Simferopil was taken on November 1 by the advanced detachment of 72 PDN. The enemy was thus not only deprived of the opportunity to create a defense on the northern spurs of the mountains, but all his forces, pushed into the mountains east of the road Simferopol, Alushta, were doomed to destruction. The saving port of Theodosia was already closed to them 42 AC. 30 Ak soon seized the coastal road Alushta, Yelta, Sevastopol. His breakthrough culminated in the bold capture of Fort Balaklava, carried out by the 105th PP under the command of the brave Colonel Muller. Thus, this small port, which was the base of the Western powers in the Crimean War, was under our control. On the right flank of the army was thrown forward motorized Brigade Ziegler, in order to cut the enemy's escape route to Sevastopol as soon as possible. It actually managed to occupy in time on this road crossings over the rivers Alma and Kutcha. It's the reconnaissance battalion of the 22nd PD, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel von Bodien, which was part of this brigade, broke through the mountains to the southern coast near Yalta. Thus, all the highways that the enemy could have used to retreat to Sevastopol were cut off. His troops, pushed into the mountains to the east of the road Simferopol, Alushta, could reach the fortress only on difficult mountain roads. However, the tempting idea to make a surprise raid on Sevastopol by the forces of Ziegler's brigade had to be abandoned. The forces of this brigade would not be enough even if the enemy did not have a strong cover on the approaches to the fortress. The 54th Corps, which followed closely behind the brigade, was tasked to break through the Belbek and Shania rivers and finally cut off the retreat to Sevastopol to the enemy units in the mountains. However, the corps, after active pursuit on the approaches to the fortress between the rivers Kacha and Belbek, as well as during its advance in the mountains to the river Shania, encountered stubborn resistance. The enemy had in the fortress four more combat ready brigades of Marines, which formed the core of the defense army grouped here. The fortress artillery began to operate. From the parts of the seaside army pushed into the mountains, quite significant forces reached Sevastopol by mountain roads, but without guns and transport. They were immediately resupplied by sea. Numerous working battalions, made up of the workers of this major naval base and armed with weapons from the fortress warehouses, also strengthened the ranks of the defenders. Thanks to the energetic measures of the Soviet commander, the enemy was able to halt the advance of 54, AC on the approaches to the fortress. In connection with the presence of sea communications, the enemy considered himself even strong enough to start an offensive from the coast north of Sevastopol with the support of the fleet fire against the right flank of 54. It was necessary to transfer here to support 22 PD from the composition of 30 AC. In these circumstances, the army command had to abandon its plan to take Sevastopol by a sudden attack from the east and southeast. In addition, to ensure the offensive from the east was not possible due to the lack of roads. So the highway marked on the captured maps in fact did not exist. Its beginning was cut off in inaccessible rocky and wooded terrain. Although the pursuit thus failed to culminate in the capture of the fortress of Sevastopol, it still resulted in the almost complete destruction of the enemy outside it. Six divisions of the 11th Army destroyed most of the enemy's two armies, numbering 12 rifle and four cavalry divisions escaped through the Kerch Strait and withdrew to Sevastopol, only the remnants of the troops who lost all heavy weapons. If they soon managed to turn them in Sevastopol in full-fledged combat-ready troops, it is due to the fact that the enemy, having dominance at sea, was able to ensure timely delivery of replenishment and equipment. Having seized the Crimea, except for the fortress area of Sevastopol, the 11th Army acquired, if I may say so, 
its own theater of military operations, and although it had to face difficult times, although the troops required the greatest tension of all forces, yet the beauty of the terrain and milder climate to some extent compensated for this. The northern part of the Crimea is a deserted Solunchak steppe. Only salt fields deserve attention here. In large reservoirs, Sivash water is evaporated and in this way salt is extracted, which is rarely found elsewhere in Russia. Villages in this part of the peninsula are poor and consist mainly of shabby huts. The central part of Crimea is flat, almost treeless, but fertile terrain, but in winter it walks icy winds from the wide steppes of eastern Ukraine. Large, rich collective farms were located here, the inventory of which, of course, had been destroyed or taken away by the Soviets. We immediately set about returning the land to the expropriated peasants, as far as the interests of production permitted. In view of this, most of them were on our side, but they were terrorized by the guerrillas operating in the Yala Mountains. The Yala Mountains form the southern part of the Crimea. They rise sharply from the flat plain of the central Crimea, reaching a height of 2,000 meters and steeply steep to the south, to the Black Sea. The mountains are covered with shrubbery. The peaks are therefore difficult to access and were convenient hiding places for partisans. In the valleys cutting through the mountains to the north, there were rich orchards and picturesque Tatar villages. The orchards were marvelous in bloom, and in the forest in spring the most beautiful flowers bloomed, such as I had never seen anywhere else. The former capital of the Tatar Khans, Bakhtisare, picturesquely located by a small mountain river, still retained its oriental flavor. The Khan's palace is a pearl of Tatar architecture. The southern coast of Crimea, often compared to the Riviera, perhaps surpasses it in beauty. Its whimsical outlines of mountains, steep cliffs falling into the sea, make it one of the most beautiful corners of Europe. In the area of Yalta, not far from which is located the royal palace Levadia, the mountains are covered with the most marvelous forest imaginable. Everywhere, where there was a little space between the mountains, the fertile land is covered with vine and fruit plantations. Tropical plants grow everywhere, and especially in the marvelous park surrounding the Levadia Palace. One feels like in the gardens of paradise. Who of us could foresee then that in these gardens of paradise a few years later, there would be events, as a result of which half of Europe would be given to the Soviets? Who could have foreseen that the leaders of the two great Anglo-Saxon nations would fall for a cruel despot, pretending to be a kindly man to such an extent? We marveled at the paradise that lay before our eyes, but we did not see the serpent lurking in that paradise. Not only the beauty of the area, but also the historical past at every turn caught our attention. The port cities of Evetatoria, Sevastopol, Theodosia grew out of ancient Greek colonies. After the capture of Sevastopol, we discovered the ruins of ancient Greek temples on the Chersonese Peninsula. Then Goths have based the state in rocky mountains east of Sevastopol. The ruins of a huge fortress in the mountains still testify about it. They held here for centuries, and from time to time in the ports settled Genoese, and later Crimea became a Tatar Khanate, withstood the onslaught of the Russians until modern times. The Tatars immediately took our side. They saw us as their liberators from the Bolshevik yoke, especially since we respected their religious customs. A Tatar deputation came to me bringing fruit and beautiful handmade fabrics for the liberator of the Tatars, Adolf F. The eastern tip of Crimea, the elongated Kerch Peninsula, looks quite different. It is a plain, only partially covered with waves of hills, and on the eastern shore, at the narrow straits separating Crimea from the Kuban region, rise to a great height of bare heights. There are deposits of coal and ore on the peninsula, as well as minor deposits of oil. Large industrial enterprises grew around the port city of Kerch, which lies near the strait. The surrounding mountains had branching rock caves in which guerrillas and later remnants of the defeated landing force hid. While the rear headquarters department was located in the Crimean capital Simferopol, almost completely Russified city, picturesquely located at the northern spurs of the Yela, the first echelon of the headquarters moved to Sarabaz, a large village north of Simferopol. We conveniently located there our staff services in a large new-built school. Such schools were built by the Soviets in almost all large villages. I myself, with the chief of staff and several officers, lived in a small building of the board of the fruit collective farm, in which each of us occupied one modest room. The furnishings of my room consisted of a bed, a table, a chair, a stool on which stood a basin for washing, and a clothes rack. We could, of course, bring furniture from Simferopol, 
but it was not in the spirit of our headquarters to create for ourselves the comforts that the soldiers were deprived of. On this modest apartment we stayed until August 1942, only twice in June 1942, when our headquarters was near Sevastopol, detached to the CP on the Kerch section. After our former gypsy life, this was a new and not altogether pleasant way of life for us. When a headquarters is tied to one place, not only a firm daily routine is inevitable, but a paper war is bound to begin. I endured this war in my schoolroom between two brick stoves, built by us on the Russian model, since the heating, of course, was destroyed by the Soviets. I would like here to touch upon one problem which has always worried me, although the heavy worries caused by the operational situation in the winter of 1940-2 pushed it into the background. The army commander also exercises supreme jurisdiction in his army, and the hardest part of this is the approval of death sentences. Secondly, on the one hand, the first duty of the commander is to maintain discipline and to determine, in the interests of the troops, the punishment for cowardice shown in battle. But, on the other hand, it is not easy to realize that by your signature you are destroying a human life. It is true that death takes hundreds and thousands of lives every day in war, and every soldier is ready to give his life. But it is one thing to fall honestly in battle, to be caught by a deadly bullet, although you expect it every moment, but still unexpectedly and another thing to stand in front of the rifle barrels of your own comrades and leave the ranks of the living with shame. Of course there could be no question of mercy when a soldier by his shameful actions damaged the honour of the army, when his actions led to the death of his comrades, but there are always cases, the cause of which is understandable human weakness, not a base way of thinking, and yet the court according to the law should have imposed the death penalty. In no case where the death sentence was involved, did I confine myself to the report of the chairman of my army tribunal, of whom I can say nothing bad. I always personally examined the case in the most detailed manner. When, at the very beginning of the war, two soldiers of my corps were sentenced to death for having raped and then murdered an old woman, it was only fair. But it was quite a different matter in the case of a soldier who had been awarded the Iron Cross in the Polish campaign and was taken from the hospital to a unit that was foreign to him. On the first day the commander of his machine gun crew and the rest of the numbers were killed, and he could not stand it and ran. By law he should have been executed, but still in this case, although it was a question of cowardice in battle, posing a threat to his troops, could not be measured by the same yardstick, it is true that I could not simply overturn the decision of the military tribunal of the unit. Therefore, in this and similar cases, I resorted to the following measure. I postponed for four weeks the confirmation of the death sentence. If the soldier acquitted himself in battle within that period, I would cancel the sentence. If he again showed cowardice, the sentence would take effect. Of all those to whom I thus granted probation, only one subsequently defected to the enemy. The rest either acquitted themselves in battle or fell in heavy fighting like real soldiers. Now the 11th Army had the task of storming the last enemy stronghold in the Crimea of Sevastopol. The earlier this offensive will be undertaken, the less time will be given to the enemy to organize its defense, the greater will be the chances of success, and the less was the danger of an enemy landing from the sea. The first task was to complete the encirclement of the fortress. To do this, the left flank of 54 AC needed to move further forward and, above all, to occupy the area at the junction between it and 30 AC Lu, located in the mountains southeast of Sephoftopol. This required a number of difficult battles in the mountains, to participate in which the army command also involved, provided at its disposal one Romanian mountain brigade. Before the offensive it was necessary, first of all, to solve the question of forces. There was no doubt that the four divisions standing in front of the fortress at that time were not enough to carry out its assault. They were not even enough to create a solid front. In addition, it turned out that the enemy, with the help of the above-mentioned measures, managed in a relatively short time to bring the strength of the defending troops to nine divisions. This fact showed how necessary it was, first of all, to cut his maritime communications. In order to achieve decisive success, the 11th Army had thus to pull up all the forces that would prove possible to use. But, on the other hand, it was also clear that the enemy, who dominated the sea, could undertake a landing at any time and on any stretch of coastline he chose for this purpose, unless the coast was adequately guarded. Thus the army command was faced with a choice, either to take a great risk, denuding the territory of the Crimean and especially the Kerch Peninsula, 
or to question in advance the success of the proposed assault, allocating for him knowingly insufficient forces. The choice was in favour of the assault. In its organisation we were guided by the following considerations. It was necessary to attack the enemy from several directions, if possible, to prevent the concentration of his forces on one attacked section of the fortress front. In order to break the resistance of the fortress, it was necessary as a precondition to as soon as possible put under their control the port, the Bay Sevenaya. As long as the fortress had maritime communications, in the current state of affairs, the enemy would constantly maintain superiority over us in terms of technical support, and perhaps even in numbers. Therefore, the main blow had to be struck from the north or northeast in the direction of Sevenaya Bay, therefore not at all the way the Allies struck in the Crimean War when they had dominance at sea. What mattered to us was not the city, but the port. Only in the north our army could use its powerful artillery to support the offensive organization of its ammunition supply through the mountains in the southern section of the given transport capabilities was unrealistic, especially since the coastal road at any time could be taken under enemy fire from the sea. If the enemy fortifications in the northern section were stronger and more numerous than in the southern section, the terrain in the southern section, steep, rocky mountains, was extremely difficult to access. In addition, the road network in the southern section was completely inadequate. In order to create it, it was necessary to work for a long time. Based on these considerations, the army command decided to strike the main blow from the north or northeast. In the south, it was decided to conduct an auxiliary offensive mainly for the purpose of constraining and diverting enemy forces. In the north was to advance 54 AK, which for this purpose were subordinated to four divisions as well as most of the heavy artillery. The restraining blow in the south was to strike the 30th AC, which had for this purpose at its disposal. In addition to 72 PD, also transferred from Kerch 170 PD and the Romanian Mountain Brigade. From the Kerch side was pulled up also 73 PD, which was to make up a reserve of troops advancing from the north. Thus, on the Kerch Peninsula remained only the headquarters of the 42nd Corps with 46 PD. The headquarters of the Romanian Mountain Corps, with its subordinate, four mountain brigade operated in the mountains of Yela, as a strong, well-prepared partisan movement had developed here from the very beginning. Partisan detachments received a large replenishment at the expense of scattered in the mountains parts of the Maritime Army, and constantly threatened our communications on the road to Feodosia and on the Sevastopol front south of the mountain range. Thus, the protection of the coast was provided, in addition to the 8th Romanian Cavalry Brigade on the eastern shore, only a few newly created coastal batteries and rear units of our divisions. Of course, given that the Soviet fleet had dominance at sea, this meant a great risk for the Army Command, but this risk seemed justified if the offensive on Sevastopol will begin soon enough, before the enemy has time in the Cuban or in the Caucasus to form new forces to land from the sea. The moment of the beginning of the offensive was, therefore, of great importance. According to our calculations, the necessary regrouping of troops and supplying artillery ammunition could be completed by November 27 or 28, on this date and was scheduled to start the offensive. But here we were hindered by the Russian winter and in two ways, which was particularly bad. In the Crimea began continuous rains, which in the shortest possible time put out of action all roads without hard surface. The network of paved roads in Crimea starts only from Simferopol, from the mainland to Simferopol leads only often found in this country country road, which is levelled only the roadway and on the sides of which ditches are dug. In dry weather such roads on the clay soil of southern Russia are very passable, but during the rainy season they had to be immediately closed so that they would not fail completely and for a long time. Thus, with the onset of rains, the army practically lost the opportunity to ensure its supply by motorised transport at least in the area from the mainland to Simferop. By November 17, 50 of our transport was already out of service for technical reasons. On the mainland in the north, a fierce frost was already raging, which put out of operation four locomotives out of five, available to us south of the Dnieper. Thus the supply of the army was now limited to one two echelons daily. The Dnieper was covered with ice, but it was still too thin, and it was impossible to build a bridge because of the ice. Preparations for the offensive were delayed because of all this. Instead of November 27, we were able to begin artillery preparation only on December 17. 
It is clear that this loss of time was in the hands of the enemy, who did not encounter such difficulties in his fortified area. In addition, every day increased the danger of landing new enemy forces from the sea. So with a delay of three weeks, a delay that, as it turned out, decided the outcome of this operation, 54 RK in the northern section and 30 ACS in the south were finally ready for the offensive. But before that, the army command had to make another difficult decision. It's on October 17, because of the aggravated situation near Rostov, the army group command demanded immediately allocate to its disposal 73 PD and 170 PD. All the explanations of the command of the 11th Army that this would disrupt the offensive on Sevastopol led only to the fact that we were left 170 PD moving along the coastal road to connect with the 30th Army. It would still be too late to arrive at Rostov, but nevertheless, without 73 PD, we were deprived of the reserve necessary for the offensive in the northern section. The army command had to decide whether it made sense to launch an offensive in these conditions. It decided to take the risk. There is no opportunity to detail here the course of the offensive. It was necessary to first knock out the enemy by a sudden attack from the supply line in the area between the Belbec and Kacha rivers. At the same time, it was necessary to capture his strongholds in the Belbec Valley and on the elevated southern bank of the river. Further offensive was to be conducted through the glacis of the fortress to Sevania Bay. The main burden of the battle was borne by the brave 22 Nischensaxon, infantry division led by its excellent commander, Lieutenant General Wolf. Success depended on it. It cleared the enemy from the supply line between the rivers Katja and Belbeck, together with 132 PD advancing to the south, stormed the heights on the south bank of the Belbeck River Valley, and broke through to the zone of fortifications to the south of the valley. So that the wedge of the offensive was getting narrower and narrower, as 50 PD and 24 PD, advancing from the east in the direction of Sevenaya Bay, did not make any significant progress in the mountainous terrain overgrown with almost impassable shrubbery. In the battles for stubbornly defended by the enemy, long-term structures troops suffered heavy losses. The beginning of severe cold weather required extreme tension of their forces. And yet in the last days of December, the fighting did not stop on Christmas Day. The tip of the advancing wedge approached Fort Stalen, the capture of which would have meant at least the mastery of the dominant over the Bay of the Northern NP for our artillery. If we had fresh troops, the breakthrough to Sevenaya Bay would have succeeded. But they were not, because 73rd PD, we had to give up. And to replace it could not even the most energetic concentration of the advancing divisions on the direction of the main blow. In this environment, and there was a landing of Soviet paratroops first at Kerch and then at Feudosia. It was a mortal danger for the army at a time when all its forces, with the exception of one German division and two Romanian brigades, were fighting for Sevastopol. It was quite clear that it was urgent to transfer forces from under Sevastopol to the threatened areas. Any delay was detrimental. But was it possible to abandon the offensive on Sevastopol at a time when it seemed that only the last effort was enough to at least achieve control over the base of Anaya? In addition, it seemed indisputable that it would be easier to release forces from under Sevastopol after success in the northern section of the front than in case of premature weakening of the pressure on the enemy. So the army command decided, even after the landing at Feodosia, still go to the increasing with every hour the risk of delaying the release of troops from under Sevastopol. Therefore, at first was only ordered to stop the offensive 30 AC, and 170 PD was sent to the threatened Kerch Peninsula, on the northern section of the front, in agreement with the commander of the 54th AK and division commanders, was to make one last attempt to break through to Severnaya Bay. As always, the troops applied all their strength, 16 PP under the command of Colonel von Holtitz, advancing in the direction of the main blow of 22 PD, still managed to break through into the barrier strip of Fort Stalin, but this was the end of the offensive strength. December 30, the commanders of the advancing divisions reported that further attempts to continue the offensive do not promise success. The army command gave the order to finally suspend the offensive, after good reasons given by him in a telephone report to the front headquarters, convinced Hitler of the need for this and Hitler. Moreover, we had to give the order to withdraw troops from the northern section of the front to the heights north of the Belbeck Valley. Without this measure, it would have been impossible to release the necessary forces. Our troops, deeply embedded in the enemy's location, it would be difficult to hold on for long. The fact that Hitler was dissatisfied with this decision 
because it contradicted the strict order he had just issued, forbidding voluntary abandonment of anything. It meant nothing compared to the responsibility that I felt before the troops who suffered such heavy losses. But it was thinking about my troops and how to keep the men alive that forced me to make this decision. So, the first attempt to storm the fortress of Sevastopol failed. We still had the advantage of a tighter encirclement of the fortress, which required fewer forces. We also seized convenient initial positions for the subsequent offensive. Thirty Ak in the south also captured important points on the ground necessary for the subsequent offensive. But this was a faint consolation when one considers the casualties suffered. The landing of Soviet troops on the Kerch Peninsula, undertaken just at the moment when the outcome of the battle on the northern section of the Sevastopol front was being decided, as it soon turned out, was not just a maneuver of the enemy, designed to divert our forces. Soviet radio stations reported that it was an offensive with a decisive purpose, with the aim of regaining the Crimea, carried out by order and according to Stalin's plans. As it was announced on the radio, the struggle would be ended only by the destruction of the 11th Army in the Crimea, and that these words were not an empty threat, was soon confirmed by the large mass of troops thrown into this offensive. In this circumstance, as well as in the fact that the enemy spent the forces, without reckoning with anything, felt the cruel will of Stalin. December 26. The enemy, having ferried two divisions across the Gulf of Kerch, landed paratroops on both sides of the city of Kerch, then followed the landing of smaller landings on the northern coast of the peninsula. The command of the 42nd Army, which had at its disposal for the defense of the peninsula only 146 PD, was, of course, in an unenviable position. Tauchbumek therefore requested permission from the army command to leave the Kerch Peninsula, meaning to lock the exits from it at the Isthmus of Papacha. But the army command did not share his opinion. If the enemy managed to strengthen in the Kerch area, the peninsula would be another section of the front, and the situation for the army, while not yet taken Sevastopol, would be extremely dangerous. Therefore, the army command ordered 42 AC, taking advantage of the weakness of the newly landed enemy, to throw him into the sea. In order to fully release to fulfill this task 46 PD, the army command sent to the area of Feodosia standing near Simferopol for Romanian Mountain Brigade and 8th Romanian Cavalry Brigade, providing protection of the eastern coast of the Crimea with the task of eliminating possible enemy landings on this critical section of the front. At the same time there was sent from under Genikesk and Feodosia the last of the regiments withdrawn from the Crimea 73 PD. By December 28, 46, PL really managed to eliminate the enemy bridgeheads north and south of Kerch, except for a small strip of land on the northern coast. Nevertheless, Count Spienek again requested permission to leave the Kerch Peninsula, so that the army command strongly objected to this, because we still held the opinion that after the abandonment of the Kerch Peninsula will be such a situation, to cope with which our army will not be able to cope. The enemy was preparing for a new strike. On December 29, we received a report from Fedotosha that at night the enemy there landed a landing under the cover of a significant force of the fleet. Insignificant forces of our troops, standing near Fedosia, were not able to prevent the landing. Telephone communication with the headquarters of the 42nd Corps, located approximately in the centre of the peninsula, was interrupted. At 10 o'clock a radiogram was received from it that Count Spunik, ordered to leave the Kerch Peninsula immediately in view of the enemy landing at Feodosia. The order of the army command, which prohibited this withdrawal, was no longer accepted by the radio station of the Corp headquarters. Although we could agree with the fear of the Corps headquarters, which was afraid to be cut off from the 46th PD on the Kerch Peninsula landed enemy landing force, we still believe that too hasty withdrawal can in no way contribute to the improvement of the situation. If at this point the enemy can activate the remnants of their forces at Kerch, he will immediately begin to pursue 46 PD. This division would find itself on the Isthmus of Papacha, between two fires. Simultaneously with the order prohibiting to leave the Kerch Peninsula, the army command gave the order to the Romanian Mounting Corps by the forces of the above two brigades and the Romanian Motorized Regiment, which was on the approach, to immediately throw into the sea landed at Feodosia landing force of the enemy. We, however, had no illusions about the offensive spirit of the Romanian formations, but the enemy could not yet have at Feodusia large forces on land. Decisive actions could use this weakness. We had reason to hope that the Romanians, at least, 
will be able to keep the enemy within a small bridgehead at Feodosia until the German troops will not approach. But even this hope was not destined to come true. The Romanian Mountain Corps offensive on Feodosia was not only unsuccessful, but moreover, the Romanians retreated in front of the few Soviet tanks, moving away from the line east of the town of Steri Krim. The 46th PD forced a forced march to the Isthmus of Papacha, but it had to leave most of its guns on icy roads. In addition, its personnel was completely exhausted by the hardships of this retreat. Following 46 PD, the enemy was immediately able to begin the pursuit from the small bridgeheads left behind. The Kerch Strait had frozen over, allowing the enemy to quickly pull up new forces. If the enemy had taken advantage of the situation and would have quickly pursued the 46th PD from Kerch, as well as hit decisively after the Romanians withdrawing from Feodosia, it would have created a situation hopeless not only for this newly emerged section of the eastern front of the 11th Army, the fate of the entire 11th Army would be decided. More decisive enemy could rapid breakthrough to Dzankoi paralyze the entire supply of the army. Dutch's troops withdrawn from Sevastopol, 170 PD, and after the cessation of the offensive from the north and 132 PD could arrive in the area west or northwest of Feodosia no sooner than 14 days. But the enemy failed to use the favorable moment. Either the enemy command did not realize their advantages in this situation, or it did not decide to immediately use them. From the captured operational maps, it was clear that landed at Fidozier 44 Army had only one goal, to reach by January 4 in the area west and northwest of the city of Old Crimea, available to this time at its disposal by six divisions, to then take up the defense on the achieved line. Apparently, even having a triple superiority in strength, the enemy did not dare to dare a bold, deep operation, which could lead to the defeat of the 11th Army. Obviously, he wanted to accumulate first even more forces. But the enemy did not actually reach even the above-mentioned boundary west of the town of Steri Krim. The 51st Army, advancing through Kerch, pursued the 46th Army very hesitantly. The 44th Army, which landed at Feudosia, first made only cautious sorties in the decisive western and northwestern direction. To our surprise, it directed its main forces not in this direction, but to the east, towards the 51st Army. The enemy clearly saw only his tactical goal, the destruction of our forces on the Kerch Peninsula, and completely lost sight of the operational goal, crossing the main vital artery of the 11th Army. Thus, we managed to create from exhausted 46 PD, arrived meanwhile reinforced 213 P and Romanian units very, however, fragile front cover at the boundary of the northern spurs of the Yala near the old Crimea, the coast of Sivash west of Akmanai. All the officers, non-commissioned officers and soldiers who could be released were sent to reinforce the Romanian units, and they were to ensure the proper use of heavy weapons by the Romanians. 